Welcome back to the biosignaling playlist. Um, what we're going to do in this video is talk about um, propagation of the actual signal. Okay, and what we're going to find is that the nervous system really is a large component of the control of these G proteins and all all this good stuff. Okay, so a lot of the control of, of G proteins, like adrenergic receptors, okay, is ultimately controlled by the nervous system. So what I've drawn here, I've drawn an axon up here. Okay, this structure right here, this is called the terminal the terminal end bulb, okay? And the terminal end bulb stores a lot of neurotransmitter. And I've denoted that by having the circle, which is a vesicle with the X in it. X is the neurotransmitter, okay? Um, these green things, these green proteins, these are supposed to be uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. So we'll put, uh, we'll put voltage-gated um, S. Let me do that over again. These are going to be, I keep hitting a button on my pen, uh, voltage gated sodium channels these red ones are going to be voltage gated calcium channels okay and again this is not at least for the purposes of biochemistry this is not a physiology class but um, you have to understand a little bit about the action potential to really understand what's happening okay so we're assuming that we have an action potential that's moving along the axon okay draw a lightning bolt we have an, an action potential that's moving along okay now, what is important to understand is that um, these voltage-gated sodium channels, okay, uh, they, what they have is they basically have six, I believe it's six subunits, okay, uh, or not six, they, they have, um, they have um, multiple subunits that come together, but each one of the subunits has six domains, okay. So there's multiple subunits, but each subunit has six domains. Now, um, each one of those subunits has a domain four. Okay, obviously if there's six domains, they have a domain four, right? And domain four is what's referred to as a voltmeter. Okay, so um, as the concentration of sodium increases in the cytosol, okay, um, which in this case inside here is the cytosol, right? It's the cytosol of the axon, okay? When the sodium concentration increases in there, Effectively, what happens is the, the subunit 4, or excuse me, the domain 4, senses that, and it causes the sodium, voltage-gated sodium channel to change conformation, and it allows sodium to enter the axon, okay? So we're already assuming that the axon hillock, way over here, the axon hillock generated the action potential by opening a voltage-gated sodium channel, okay? Um, now you have a string of voltage-gated sodium channels that have opened, and we're assuming that right here, okay, I'm going to do this in green, right here we're assuming that we just input some sodium, okay? So effectively that changes the voltage inside the axon nearby um, this voltage-gated sodium channel, right? And domain four of each subunit senses that with its voltmeter, right? It basically is a voltmeter, and so the sodium channel changes conformation and sodium influxes into the axon, okay? And what you're gonna find is I'll label this, um, let's call this influx one, okay? Then you're gonna have influx two, okay? And you're gonna keep having these influxes into the axon. Again, we're not going in excruciating detail here, but suffice it to say that um, as one voltage-gated sodium channel opens, you get a, a, a sharp increase in the sodium concentration nearby the next voltage-gated sodium channel. The voltmeter at domain four of each subunit senses that, then the whole protein changes conformation and allows sodium to influx into, um, into the axon cytosol, right? So now what you have is, assuming you get to this point, you have a whole bunch of positive inside the axon, right, nearby these red voltage-gated calcium channels, okay? Now, effectively what happens is, and again, what you could sort of view it as, the action potential is effectively these sodium cha sodium ch channels opening and the sodium influxing, okay? That's what the action potential actually is, okay? Now what you have to view is we have this positive charge in the axon um, near these voltage-gated calcium channels, and the calcium channels are set up in a similar manner to the sodium channels. They have multiple subunits that assemble together, and um, effectively what happens is um, they um, have, a, again, they have a, a domain four of each subunit that's a voltmeter, okay? Now, 
These voltage gated and calcium channels are a little bit different than the sodium channels in that effectively what happens is each one of these vesicles is tethered to a voltage gated calcium channel. Okay, so what happens is um, the sodium influxes in here creates a, a depolarizing uh, signal, and when the voltage gated calcium channels domain four senses that calcium quickly rushes through the channels into it rushes into the cytosol of the terminal end bulb, right? And when this happens, okay, the calcium ion is running through, the calcium ion is running through um, the channel, and effectively what that does is it helps to change the conformation, change the conformation of this protein. And remember, the vesicles with the neurotransmitter are tethered to the protein, right? So when the protein changes conformation, it effectively moves the vesicle through through um, the membrane and it dumps the neurotransmitter into the snaps. Okay, so I'm attempting to draw that here. So when calcium ion binds and moves through the voltage gated calcium channels, again, the voltage is sensed by domain four. Um, effectively, what happens is the neurotransmitter, whatever it turns out to be, is dumped into the snaps because the change in conformation moves the tether. Uh, through the membrane, okay, and effectively the neurotransmitter gets dumped into the snaps as the vesicle um, becomes actually part of the membrane of the axon end bulb, okay? So now you have an increase in the concentration of the neurotransmitter in the snaps. So this structure right here, this area between this particular neuron and this one, that's your synapse, okay? And sometimes they'll call it the synaptic cleft. It's just a space between an axon and another structure. And if it's another nerve, it's just a, a nerve synapse, okay? If you're talking about the synapse between a nerve and a muscle, it's the neuromuscular junction, okay? That's just a special case, okay? And specifically, that's between the motor neuron and the um, motor end plate. Okay, but what we're going to do here is we're going to use this neurotransmitter as an example, okay? And I sort of went through the X there, but um, this, you'll probably recognize that it's glutamate. So glutamate can act as a neurotransmitter, okay? And glutamate has two main um, receptors. It has an NMDA receptor, which, by the way, is a calcium, a calcium channel, okay? And AMPA, which controls a sodium channel, okay? Now... Let's say that um, let's say that um, glutamate first binds to the NMDA receptor. So some of it will bind to the NMDA receptor. So what you can effectively say will happen is we have calcium. Let's kind of draw it small there. Calcium when 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 the glutamate binds to the NMDA receptor. So we're assuming that X glutamate is bound. Calcium will flux into the post through the postsynaptic membrane into the next axon. Okay. Likewise, if we have, and again, sodium is green, I guess. So if we have sodium in the synapse, right, when glutamate, again, glutamate is an X, when glutamate binds to the AMPA receptor, sodium moves through, through the postsynaptic membrane into the postsynaptic ax, or the postsynaptic neuron, right? So depending on what receptor the hormone or neurotransmitter binds to, in this case, the neurotransmitter, that dictates what the what the uh, ion that moves through is, right? Now, something that's really important to understand is this, okay? The ultimate identity of the ion that moves through the membrane is dependent on which receptor it is. And I purposely chose these two receptors to illustrate that, okay? When glutamate binds to the NMDA receptor, that specifically is calcium, okay? It's a calcium channel. Recall that calcium and sodium are high in the extracellular fluid. That includes the synapse, right? Okay. So when you bind to the NMDA receptor, you influx calcium because a, a, a ligand-gated calcium channel opens, right? But when you bind to an AMPA receptor, okay, sodium influxes because it's, it's a ligand-gated sodium channel, okay? So the identity of the ion that moves through the membrane is receptor-dependent. It depends on which receptor you're talking about, Okay. Uh, for instance, there are multiple kinds of there are multiple kinds of of, of GABA receptors. GABA does the opposite thing that um, glutamate does. It's hyperpolarizing. Okay, GABA there's a GABA A and a GABA B. And don't quote me on this. I believe GABA A is a chloride channel, and GABA B is a potassium channel. So again, the actual identity of the receptor depend uh, dictates which uh, ion moves through the membrane. Okay, but in general, your rule is this. Okay. 
If calcium or sodium moves from the ECF to the ICF, that's a depolarizing potential, okay? It's depolarizing. Now, we're not going into the excruciating details here, but suffice it to say, if calcium and sodium move into the, into the cytosol, again, this is a cytosol, right? It's a strained cytosol because the, the, the cell looks strange, right? But it's cytosol, right? If you have sodium or calcium move into the cytosol, it's depolarizing, meaning that the inside of a cell becomes less negative. You're moving positive charges into the cytosol, so it becomes less negative, okay? The other rule is if you have chloride influx or potassium efflux, meaning if you have, meaning if I have a cell, right, just so you can see a picture, if I have a cell, right, and I have chloride, here's chloride negative charge influx or potassium uh, positive charge efflux, that's a hyperpolarizing potential, meaning that you're making the inside more negative, okay? So if you need more, um, if you need to get more understanding on depolarization versus hyperpolarization, certainly do that. But for the purposes of an undergrad biochemistry, we're not concerned with that. But n note that the, the identity of the ion that moves through is number one, dependent on the receptor, but also it's obviously dependent on the neurotransmitter. For instance, GABA, GABA does the opposite of glutamate. GABA actually, GABA A, I believe, is a chloride channel. GABA B is potassium. But ultimately, GABA, its effect is hyperpolarized. Okay? Glutamate is the opposite. Glutamate is depolarizing, right? It's moving either calcium or sodium. And there are other, there are other glutamate uh, receptors that act as well. Uh, these ones happen to be ionotropic. Um, but in general, um, uh, glutamate is depolarizing, right? It either moves calcium or sodium. Okay? So that's, that's an important thing to note. So the neurotransmitter and the receptor dictate which ion moves through, okay? And ultimately what the cell is going to do, what this, what this cell right here is going to do, is it's going to summate, it's going to summate all the charges. And if you get to approximately negative 55 millivolts, you get another action potential, okay? But that's beside the point, okay? You'll learn about that when you take physiology or anatomy and physiology, okay? But suffice it to say, the identity of the ion that moves through, again, I can't underscore this enough, is dependent on the receptor and it's dependent on the neurotransmitter, okay? So remember, GABA could open either chloride or potassium channels. It depends on the receptor, but GABA in general is hyperpolarizing. Glutamate does the opposite. It either opens calcium or sodium channels and therefore is depolarized, okay? So now let's look at an example of something that we've seen before, okay? We're gonna basically look at um, the mechanism of how something like epinephrine works, okay? But we're gonna do it from the perspective of the axon, okay? So again, we're assuming that the voltage, the action potential is moving along here, and it's going to create a lot of positive charge near these voltage-gated uh, calcium channels, right? And then we're going to assume that calcium moves in. All right, so calcium is going to move in here, right? So here's calcium ions moves into the cytosol, the end bulb, right? And we're assuming that we already have a lot of, and let's let's actually, um, here's a vesicle, right? But we're going to have epinephrine. So epinephrine, by the way, if you wanted to know, looks like this. So it has an aromatic catechol ring, and then you have a hydroxyl group right here. So this right here is epinephrine, okay? Um, it's different than norepinephrine in that it has this methyl group right here, okay? But other than that, it's, it's one of your catecholamines. By the way, catecholamines are defined by having this structure right here. This is the catechol ring. So catecholamines are defined by having that. So your main catecholamines are L-dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Okay, but anyways. Um, Epinephrine is going to be released, okay, when, when voltage-gated calcium channels become activated. Again, they're domain four, okay, they're domain four, senses the voltage from the action potential, and they end up releasing the neurotransmitter, in this case, epinephrine, into the snaps, right? And so it's going to bind to this receptor. This right here is our adrenergic receptor, right? And what I attempted to draw here was the, the way I drew the G protein in, the, in previous videos, okay, right here, okay, these two things are your beta and gamma subunits of your G protein. And this right here is your alpha subunit, right? So you can effectively say that in the presence of GTP, the alpha subunit dissociates and activates this enzyme. 
Okay, so again, not only is um, not only can we have um, ion channels that open, but we can also have metabotropic type things where we have activation of G proteins and things like that. Okay, so these examples right here, the AMPA, the AMPA, and up here was the NMDA. These were examples of ionotropic things where we're simply binding a hormone or a neurotransmitter to a receptor and it simply opens an ion channel. Okay. But we can also have certain types of metabotropic things where we have a hormone that binds to a receptor. In this case, this is the this is the adrenergic receptor, right? And it activates a G protein, which activates an enzyme. This right here, this enzyme could be something like adenylate cyclase or phospholipase C, something like that, right? Something we've seen in the previous video. But now at least we've seen how it is, is transmitted by an axon. Again, you have an action potential that's moving along the axon, and when you get sufficient positive charge near voltage-gated calcium channels, it causes the calcium channels to become activated, remember? And again, remember you have this tether to the, to the vesicle contained in the neurotransmitter to the, the, um, the voltage-gated calcium channel. Then when calcium moves through, it changes conformation and moves um, the vesicle into the membrane of the terminal end bulb and it moves the neurotransmitter into the synapse. So right here you could consider this also a synapse. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. And in general, if you understand this stuff, you're pretty much good for biochemistry. The purpose of this video is really just to get you accustomed to understanding that, okay, it's the neurotransmitter and its receptor that dictate the function. Okay. A lot of times we get caught up in saying, okay, well, you know, for a good example of something I'm going for is acetylcholine, okay? Acetylcholine activates muscle contraction, right? If you've, if you've studied the neuromuscular junction, you've probably seen that acetylcholine is going to open, um, uh, open a ligand-gated sodium channel, which triggers um, voltage-gated sodium channels and so forth. But ultimately, acetylcholine triggers muscle contraction, right? And then you say, okay, in the heart, so, uh, uh, acetylcholine triggers a slowing of the heart rate. So you say, okay, well, in the heart, the acetylcholine is inhibitory, right? It's slowing the heart rate down. But in muscles, it's excitatory. Well, how does that work if we have the same neurotransmitter? The absolutely critical thing to understand with this video is that the receptor pretty much dictates everything, okay? So for instance, the inhibitory acetylcholine receptor that you find in the heart okay, I believe it's on the sinoatrial node, um, is a different acetylcholine receptor than you find at the neuromuscular junction. So the actual identity of the receptor dictates what happens, whether it's going to do some kind of metabotropic activity, activate an enzyme, a biosignaling pathway, or simply it's going to um, activate an ion channel. And remember, the ion channel changes depending on which receptor you have, okay? And those are ionotropic receptors that do that. Okay, so I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuitive sense on what is happening at the synapse. Again, this is sort of a complicated looking picture, but I hope this helped. And just remember, I th the big point I want to underscore with this video is that the identity of the receptor is really what dictates the biosignaling pathway. Okay, see you soon.